So I'm in a tough spot because my career is changing. My career will end and is in the same spot right now as it will be 20 years from now and as it was the day I started. I'm a fan. I'm a huge fan of the sport. I have a favorite fighter. His name is Frank Yeager. Frank Yeager has announced that he is going to retire, that he's going to do one more. Now, I'm bringing you three months old news. I'm just sharing for you. I'm now on this. I got to have a new favorite fighter. Well, I mean, that's the way it works. Frankie can be my favorite fighter ever. He can go into a different category, but you got to have an active fighter if you're going to be a fan. So I'm looking around. And I got some great guys. I mean, I must tell you, I, I, I got some really good guys to choose from. And it's very hard for me to ignore Michael Chandler. I mean, I just got to tell you right out of the gate. All the things that Chandler used to do that were annoying are now awesome. I mean, he's doing those same things that people used to shun him for. He's doing them in commercials. He's doing them in advertising. just working for whatever reason. It takes a period of time, and then a the guy gets over. I mean, I'm just sharing that with you. And he comes head-to-head -head with Volkanovsky. Now, sure, maybe I'm a front runner. Yeah, okay. Sure, maybe I want the guy that's out front. But I'm a fan. You guys do the same thing, right? Okay. So, I mean, don't act like you were Buccaneers fans five years ago, okay? Who is with the Buccaneers? I just found out they're in Florida, for goodness sakes. You, you, bear with me. There's a little bit to be... Ah, my arm hurts. There's a little bit to being a fan that's a front runner. I hurt my arm. You guys ever done this? I hurt my arm in 2008. I had a fight. It was a huge fight at that time for little old Shale. Fight a guy named Paulo Filo. And I was warming up. and. My coach called out a one-two, and I thought, oh, one-two, whatever the combination was, but I'm a southpaw, so it was just weird. He missed the punch, and oh, I snapped that thing out there, and I fell to my knees. I was in agony. I fell to my knees. I was grabbing my arm, ah, and the coach kept saying, what's wrong? What did you do? And I ignored him. I didn't want to answer. I didn't want to, I didn't want to call it out for the whole room that's looking out. We got, we got three other teams are in there with us. Call out for the whole room. You missed the punch. So I don't say anything. He says it three times. I'm on my knees and I three times. What what did you do? I first said you you didn't catch the punch. Two minutes later, Bert Watson yells, We rolling. It's time to walk to the ring. So when I got home, I went and got my I went and got an x-ray, I had a broken arm. And I tell that whole story because it makes me look like a tough guy. I went out there and fought with a broken arm. Eh, you know, it's a hairline fracture. It's, it doesn't totally count as a break. They didn't put it in a cast or anything, but it was a broken arm. Nonetheless, it hurt right here, and I'm dealing with it now. The only other reference that I have to this pain was in the locker room in 2008. I think I have my arm broken right now. I'm going to get an x-ray as soon as I leave here today. I'll let you know how the arm is. But I got to tell you, when I come to you, about Volkanovsky. Here's what he's up to now, okay? We were told, the media reported, that Volkanovsky is not going to be able to fight at 145 pounds. As a matter of fact, we'd better interim Josh Emmett and Uriah Rodriguez because Volk's not going to be able to defend. The media told us this. I don't know what business it was of theirs, quite frankly. I, I didn't, personally don't understand that. A guy's injury report or when he can fire, how a guy feels, I, I, I have no idea why it was the media's business, but they were so far in Volkanovsky's business that they were even ready to interim his belt. I don't have a problem with interim belts, but some guys do. Use Figueredo by example. Figueredo was tremendously offended that they were going to interim his title. Use Francis Ngano. Francis Ngano was tremendously offended when they did Derek Lewis and Surreal Ghana. I don't have a problem with it, but some guys do, and I'm just sharing with you. It's kind of a big deal, and the media did this whole thing, and now Volkanovsky's come out. He never spoke on it. He never said, yeah, my wrist, my hand. He never did any of this poor me stuff. He said, sign me up for UFC 280. That's to be the reserve fighter, the replacement, for Makhlchev Oliveira. So today he tweets out. He says, eight weeks post-op, full sparring, ready to go. LFG, which means let's freaking go, hashtag 280. 
To do the math for you, in case you didn't keep up there, the champion of the world was hurt, told nobody, even though the story got out, went and handled his business, which sounds like he went and got his wrist worked on, because in the tweet he said post-op, oh, and by the way, he wants to walk into UFC 280, continuing with this backup business. This is the greatest featherweight to have ever done it. That is a statement that is co-signed by Max Holloway, that is co-signed uh, by Dustin Poirier, that is co-signed by Conor McGregor, that is co-signed by Jose Aldo. The greatest to have ever done it at featherweight, completely undefeated, reigning, undisputed champion of the world, would like to go and be a backup fighter. That's cool for me. Those are the kind of guys I like. Can you relate? I think that you guys do. But sometimes I feel as though part of the Volkanovsky story is being missed. I feel as like Volk is out there doing stuff and we're not stopping to give him the credit. The fact that Volk even fought Max a third time is a ridiculously bad idea. Not to mention, it's one that he could have avoided. He could have come to us and we'd have got him out of it. He could have come to us, the public, and said, I should not have to fight this guy who I've already fought and beaten twice. And we'd have backed him up. The same as we do Adesanya, why he doesn't have to fight Whitaker again. The same as we do Kamar Uzman, why he doesn't have to fight Covington again. We'd have backed him up and we'd have got him out of it. Not only did he do it, he did it on short notice. Another terrible idea. He won all five rounds. Right? And now he would like to go and be a backup fighter for what is arguably the hardest fight of the year at 155. The, those of you that believe that Lightweight has a champion and his champion is Charles Oliveira, I mean, you guys really believe that. That's in your soul. You truly believe that. You are offended that people would question that. You are offended that they strip Charles. You are offended that Charles is an underdog to anybody, let alone Islam. And those that believe in Islam have put their hard-earned money and have Charles at a three-to-one dog. I mean, there's passion, guys. There's passion on both sides, but it's not maybe. It's not, well, you know, if my guy can get inside, he can touch him to the body. You know, well, if my guy can control the range. Well, if my guy can keep him against the fence, right? You hear all, uh, all of this lazy and just, just nonsense talk that will never go away in MMA. Like, if you, you can go get a job at MMA if you just know a few terms. If you can say he punched his way into the clinch. If you can say his grappling. If you can talk about his cage control. If you could say, he could get inside, but this guy needs to be outside. If you could just say those terms, you go work in MMA because you'll be saying the same thing everybody else says. But there's not a X's and O's that has to happen. The Oliveira fans, all that need to happen is for that fight to go off. And all the Islam fans need to happen is for that referee to say go after they shut the door. They are positive. And a fight of that magnitude is very rare. It comes along very rare. If I told you guys a year ago, this was going to be the sought after and talked about fight of 2022. This is going to be the sought after and talked about fight in the history of the 55 pound division. Of course, I'm putting, I put Khabib and Connor right there. They're got to move them out of the way. They're an anomaly. You wouldn't have believed me. You'd have thought that was silly. If you guys saw the working and the hustling and the maneuvering of Ali Abdelaziz eight months ago, you would have called him on it and told him, don't waste your time. You're not going to get Islam a world title fight. Not in 2022. I mean, it's one of these things that it all worked out. Oh, and by the way, with everything that I just said, Volkanovsky, whose record is better than both of those guys I just discussed, whose accomplishments and championship fights are greater than both of those guys combined that I just discussed. Volkanovski would like a plane ticket. And he would like a license. And he would like somebody to call his room on 24 hours notice to let him know whether he should bring his mouthpiece to the arena when he comes to watch. How do you possibly tell him no? And I'm all ears. If you're good 
with rhetoric. Please tell me. I've seen some greats. I lived through the Obama administration. That's one of the great orators of my lifetime. I don't even know if, I don't know if President Obama truly could come out. I mean, that would be a hard one. How would you like to do it? How would you like to do it? You're Perry Mason. You've got to deliver to the jury. You've got to tell Volkanovsky no. Not that you're giving it to somebody else. Not that you've chosen somebody else. Not that you wanted to rest. Not that you have a better idea for him. You have to just straight up tell him no because it's the only answer there is. How are you going to do it? And if you're a fan like me, how can you observe Volkanovsky attempting to do this and not value it?